Professor Barry Wimpheimer is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at um, 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 Northwestern University. I'm sorry. I always have to double check that it's not the other one. It's Northwestern. And um, I would describe him, as I told him over lunch today, as being uh, one of the most knowledgeable and interesting new generation of Talmudists. Uh, Talmud, of course, as many of you know, is an absolutely central document to Judaism. Um, and we've had many different ways of studying it. Uh, Barry Wimpheimer uh, represents uh, the new generation of scholarship on um, the uh, Talmud. Let me point out that um, this is his, actually, I think, his third book. He's edited one book, um, a, a memorial book entitled The Wisdom of Bathsheba um, uh, for Dr. Beth uh, Samuels, a memorial volume. Um, his, uh, he has a book entitled Narrating the Law, the Poetics of Talmudic Legal Stories in the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2011. And there it's kind of like a, a beginning point for the way that he studies Talmud, which is to put it in a new context or new context of culture, for example, and to look at this formidable, formative document of the Jewish tradition in a variety of new dimensions that have not been explored before his generation of scholars. He comes from a very particular kind of background, a traditional background of studying Talmud, but he's leaped beyond that. And so in this second volume of his, the Talmud, with that wonderful subtitle, a biography, he then takes us into the uh, ways that Talmud is being explored today. This is an extraordinary uh, volume. The chapter that I personally liked most in my reading of it was the last chapter where he looks at Talmud in modernity. It's a very, very exciting discussion of how the Talmud has been appropriated in modern times. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, now, I have a copy of this. And I'll make the following deal, that I'm going to give this away to the very best question <laughs> that is addressed to him at the end of his um, lecture by a student, OK? Not by the community members, but by a student. Uh, OK, so I'm giving that away. I'll choose it at the very end. I'll give this book to the best questioner. You got that? Everyone understand? OK, let's welcome Professor Barry Wimpheimer. Is my mic on? Mic? Working? Yes? OK. Um, thank you, Richard Hecht, for that tremendous introduction. And I have to say, the introduction was as warm as Richard's hospitality has been on my entire visit here. He welcomed me yesterday and picked me up at the airport. He's been shuttling me around. He's taking care of me after this talk is over. So I really appreciate the invitation and also the hosting. Um, a few things. It felt like this talk was under some pressure. A few days ago, I started thinking coronavirus. Maybe I couldn't get here. Then yesterday, I arrive and I hear that there's a student strike. And somehow, you know, people didn't want this talk to happen, but we're going to have the talk anyway. About the student strike, I have to say that I remember in my graduate student days, I, uh, we went on strike to try to demand a union. And I remember for two days carrying around a sign. We didn't have a union at the time. And the university was making the claim that we weren't employees. And our very Ivy League protest chant was, if we're not workers, then we're not not working. <laughs> Think about that for a second. <laughs> Uh, but I hope that my presence here doesn't offend anyone. I would not want to cross a picket line, but this was scheduled long ago, and, uh, and I'm, ha I'm happy to be here. I, I also want to say that in what seems a lifetime ago, summer of 1997, I served as a summer rabbi at a synagogue in Santa Barbara on the Mesa called the Young Israel of Santa Barbara, now called Mesa Synagogue, I think, Mesa Shul. Um, and it was a tremendous experience for me at the time. 
It's very eye-opening. I'm going to be talking a little bit about my biography tonight, so, or to this afternoon, so you'll, you'll, you may be able to understand why some of this was so interesting for me. Um, some of the people who were in my congregation back then are here today, and I'm so happy to be back. Love Santa Barbara, really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay. A couple months ago, Jews held massive celebrations around the world commemorating the completion of a seven-year cycle of studying the Talmud, one of the core works of Judaism. These celebrations, called by the Hebrew term siyum, or the plural being siyumim, were held in venues as large as New Jersey's MetLife Stadium, a football stadium that hosted 88,000 people at its siyum. Now, most of the people involved in the commemorations were ultra-Orthodox, particularly men, who tend to dress in various uniforms that all share the primary color black, which is why one sly Brooklyn fellow became a smile-inducing meme by showing up to MetLife Stadium dressed as Waldo. <laughs> Easiest where's Waldo ever. While the Waldo images went viral, there was more serious news coverage that centered on what was new in 2020 and this commemoration. 2,000 women in Jerusalem held the first ever all women's seum. As anyone who's ever seen Yentl knows, study of the Talmud was historically denied to women until fairly recently. The New York Times article I have here about the MetLife Stadium Seum focused on the backdrop of our contemporary climate of rising anti-Semitism and violence to make the Seums a story of Jewish survival and defiance in the face of persecution and suffering. Now, I was intrigued by this article in particular because in my book, The Talmud of Biography, I develop a way of thinking about the meaning of the Talmud, not only in the sense of the words on the page, but also in the ways that the Talmud has long produced meaning as the touchstone of Judaism and Jewishness and an embodiment of Judaism. Now, permit me to digress for a bit from the Talmud's biography to my own. I was raised in a strict Orthodox home and educated in an immersive traditional way. From the time I was eight, from ages eight to 13, I competed, you may be familiar with spelling bees or things like that, we had a different kind of bee. I competed in tournaments where we memorized units of Mishnah. The Mishnah is the second century law code on which the Talmud is based. I averaged memorizing 100 Mishnah units a year during those years. So I have something like 600 Mishnahs at my peak. That was impressive in my school, but not at national and, yes, international tournaments. I once went to Montreal for one of these tournaments. At those tournaments, there was always someone who had memorized the entire Mishnah. Now, I was always a voracious reader from a young age, and some of the literature I read as a child were, were hagiographies of great rabbis, the biographies of great rabbis, particularly Eastern European rabbis. And these figures typically shared a story. They are recognized for their intellect at a very young age. They're then sent away from home to study Talmud in a yeshiva. Some of you are nodding. You probably are familiar with this trope. After rising to acknowledged prominence as a Talmud genius, they were then married off to the daughter of a wealthy family to spend the rest of their life serving as a rabbi and a community leader on the basis of their Talmud scholarship. These stories inspired me to think of Talmud as Judaism's ulti ultimate intellectual challenge. And they communicated the mysterious idea to me that someone could love studying the Talmud. It would be years before I understood what exactly that meant. Now, I started studying the Talmud the summer I turned 11. And the immersive training of studying Talmud a lot every day meant that by the time I was 13, I could read and translate a passage in the Talmud's combined Hebrew and Aramaic language. The combination didn't bother me. It was immersive. I never even knew that there was Hebrew and Aramaic. I just learned how to read it and translate it. After yeshiva high school, I traveled to Israel for a gap year in yeshiva, not because I was particularly motivated by the curriculum. Truth be told, by the time I set off to study Talmud all day in yeshiva, I was kind of tired of it. I remember like yesterday, my first minutes in yeshiva, sitting with my study partner, realizing with dread that I was expected to spend 10 hours a day studying the Talmud. I envied a buddy who was back in the dormitory throwing up because he could at least read a novel. 
For six months, I went through the motions in yeshiva, studying Talmud for hours a day while looking forward to returning stateside and beginning college. A sports nut, I was planning on becoming a lawyer so I could represent millionaire athletes. This was my big career aspiration. And then after six months and a change of instructors, something changed for me. My new Rebbe started to teach me Talmud with an eye for history. While prior instructors had always acted as if the Talmud's internal debates and I know some of you here study Talmud, and Rabbi Cohen's class, I think, is, is here. So the Talmud's internal debates between rabbis are often conceptualized as uh, happening in one simultaneous conversation. It's as if everyone is sitting in one big room talking to one another. My new teacher showed us how to notice that the different generations of the Talmud matter how to look at the medieval commentators and realize that those commentators were struggling with the same challenges of interpreting the original text that we were ourselves struggling. Suddenly, what had been a religious obligatory experience of Talmud study became the most intellectually satisfying experience I had ever had, a massive puzzle that demanded my full abilities as a reader, a translator, a thinker, and a critic. Newly energized, I began to expand my day allowing Talmud to fill all the gaps in my schedule. While the official program of my yeshiva ended at 10.30 p.m., I would stay in the study hall until 12 or 1 a.m. and just get by on less sleep. I deferred college for another year to spend a second year in yeshiva, and I became something of a fundamentalist, though perhaps not in the conventional use of the term. For me, the Talmud was my fundament. My interrogations of this corpus and the production of coherent explanations of its meaning became so important that I couldn't understand why other people would do anything else. I developed a sense of superiority that translated into a form of religious pietism. And I share this experience because I think people probably recognize among ultra-Orthodox Talmud learners that there's something like this going on. And I want to tell you that like, it is going on, and it comes from a very specific experience of how you interact with this material. Returning stateside to college, I promised myself that I would study the Talmud for six hours a day, regardless of other commitments, and I followed through on that promise. But my fundamentalism came under attack. College courses in the humanities chipped away at my insular and exclusive mission. Socialization in an environment where not everyone was a white Jewish male also affected me. Most surprisingly, though, the thing that really affected me most, I was deeply affected by a battle over the Talmud in which I became quickly embroiled. Though a student at Columbia University in New York, I was studying Talmud at Yeshiva University. I would take the one train uptown to Yeshiva, where my ways of using history to understand this material were not only uncommon, but were considered heretical and dangerous. Despite the fact that I was something of a heretic, I studied Talmud at Yeshiva during college for three years, and I returned after college for four years of rabbinical school. Much of my 20s in college and rabbinical school saw me fighting a battle for control of the Talmud's textual meaning. I was motivated by the truth of this meaning, the meaning of the text, and had very little tolerance for those who continued to study the Talmud and its commentators as if they were a group of contemporaries all sitting around together. I wrote an article that was denied publication because it was considered heresy, and when it was published a year later, the editors chopped off my explanatory introduction so no one would really understand what I was doing. And after the book was published, all of the copies of the periodical went missing. I started writing the Talmud of Biography over a decade after those fights in my 20s. And the distance was essential because I had matured and gained the necessary space and perspective to recognize what was going on in the fight I had been engaged in. I was able to create mental space for tolerating both my own historical way of looking at things and the anti-historical discourse of most traditional learners. When I started writing um, my book, which has the conceit of thinking of the Talmud as a person and writing that person's biography, I started to notice that as much as I and my opponents had locked horns over the meaning of words on the Talmud's page, there was even a whole other way in which the Talmud could be described as having lived. For, take, for example, the Korean Talmud. Any of you know anything about the Korean Talmud? I was at a conference last year, and one of my academic colleagues said, there's the Babylonian Talmud, there's the Palestinian Talmud, and there's the Korean Talmud. Um, 
So it may surprise you all to learn that the Talmud is currently very popular in South Korea. Now this is surprising because there's never been a large community or even any community of Jews in South Korea. And yet today in Korea, there are many popular works that distill the wisdom of the Talmud for Korean natives. I learned about this for the first time in a 2012 New Yorker article. The story in the article is that a Japanese writer distilled a conversation that he had had with an American rabbi in Japan in the 1980s and turned that into a book of what he called were selections from the Talmud, but were really distillations of this conversation he had had about Judaism. And then the Japanese book was somewhat popular, but it was when it was translated into Korean that it became, it started to sell like gangbusters and it was adapted into various forms. There is over, over 100 versions of the Korean adaptation of the Talmud. Um, some of the most popular, some of the most popular versions of this book are titled things like Talmud, the Secrets of Jewish Business Success. <laughs> One of the recent editions has a picture of Mark Zuckerberg on the cover. So you can kind of see where this is coming from. Now my inner Talmudic fundamentalist scoffs at the Korean Talmud. This isn't the Talmud. This isn't the Talmud that I know and love and struggle to comprehend and fight with people about in my 20s. This is something else. What place should this material have in a biography of the Talmud? But the more I thought about it in this mature place where I was creating space for everyone, the more I felt there needed to be a space for thinking about a different sense of Talmudic meaning, the Talmud's symbolic meaning. And allow me to illustrate with another example from Jewish history. In 1240, a Franciscan friar named Nicholas Donnan, who had recently converted from Judaism to Christianity, wrote an indictment of the Talmud that raised 35 charges against the Talmud. The charges included a variety of alleged heresies, at least in the eyes of Christianity, but the ones that resonated with Pope Gregory IX, the recipient of Donnan's letter, were the ones that asserted that the Babylonian Talmud was an anti-Christian work. Pope Gregory IX responded to Donnan's indictment by encouraging political authorities across Europe to seize handwritten manuscripts of the Talmud um, from which 13th century Jews studied. Only one ruler responded. King Louis IX of France was the only ruler who put Gregory's advice into effect. People were sent into Jewish homes in Paris on the Sabbath. Manuscripts of the Talmud were seized, collected, and brought under the control of Dominican and Franciscan friars. Louis IX then convened a tribunal to hear what was formally termed, in Latin and French and Hebrew, a disputation between Donin and the other Franciscans on the one side and a number of Jewish rabbis, most prominently Rabbi Yechiel of Paris, one of the, the Tosafists on the other side. Um, though it was formally labeled a disputation, which sounds like a debate. I was on a debate team in high school. You know, you, everyone gets up and they get to say their piece and then there are neutral judges who get to rule on these things. Though this was a formally labeled disputation, it was not a balanced debate in which each side is free to express itself as it would. We know what transpired because there's Latin and Hebrew accounts produced by the respective sides. After a few days of speeches from the respective sides in the presence of a tribunal that included the queen mother, Blanche of Castile, the tribunal decided the Talmud is a heretical work and needs to be suppressed. 20 to 24, there are debates about this amount, cartloads of handwritten manuscripts of the Talmud were burned in the Place de la Greve, uh, de Greve sorry, the site of high profile Parisian executions. So they took these cartloads of handwritten manuscripts and they set them on fire. For some time now, scholars have re referred to the Paris disputation as a trial in which the Talmud was the defendant, which I think is totally right, and it's exactly right. But in my view, they haven't paid enough attention to how weird this is. How strange it is that you would take a book and put it on trial and treat it like a defendant. You would indict it try it, convict it, and then execute it. In short, the Talmud is personified and then punished as a person. How do we understand this strange episode in the history of world literature? And a deeper understanding of the third, 13th century cultural context in medieval Europe sheds light on the symbolic register of this episode and explain why the trial and execution of a book were, did not seem so out of place at the time. <clears throat> 
The culture of Ashkenaz, the Jewish term for the medieval communities that Jews founded in Northern Europe, particularly France and Germany, but also in England, can be characterized by a combination of Jewish and Christian physical proximity, they lived kind of on top of each other, and a concomitant profound animosity. So they were very much intertwined and they hated each other. The villages in this part of the world were often contained within the space of a modern urban square block, much smaller than UCSB's campus, campus. But both the Jews and Christians who at times intimately cared for one another, we have all kinds of documents attesting to wet nursing practices where the women were nursing the babies of the other, but they had a visceral antipathy for one another. And visceral is an important term that I'm using here. Carol Walker Bynum, the great medieval scholar of Christianity, has demonstrated the ways in which Christian religious practice was dream being transformed in this very time, in the 13th century, in the direction of viscera. Cults emerged around physical relics that proved so appealing to the populace at large that they could not be contained by church authorities. Consider also the simultaneous rise of the ascetic Frist Franciscan order. So I'm, I'm showing you an image here of a kind of ascetic practice where people torture their own bodies. If you've, if you've ever watched the movie The Da Vinci Code or read the book, there is a, a sect in there. So simultaneously in 13th century France, the Franciscans emerge and they're putting stigmata on their own bodies to torture themselves. And meanwhile, the pietistic Hasidei Ashkenaz, a Jewish group uh, headed by Judah the Pious, who is born in almost exactly the same year as Francis of Assisi, they're doing the same thing. Both of these groups wound themselves in new and creative ways in order to transcend their bodies. This turn to the physical is also ev evident in the anti-Semitic recurring charges that you may have heard of, but you didn't possibly know that these were leveled against Jews for the first time at this point in history. So three different types of charges, accusations of host desecration, ritual murder, and blood libel began to be employed regularly against Jews and led to executions of individuals or expulsions of whole communities. Now, if you look at the three recurring charges, the host desecration, the um, ritual murder, and the blood libel, you can see something important about the symbolics of the day. Now, host desecration was a claim that Jews needed to steal the consecrated wafer of the Eucharist to reenact the passion of killing Jesus by desecrating his body embodied in the wafer. Right, so this was the accusation against the Jews that they had stolen the wafer and they had done things to it. Ritual murder was a charge that Jews needed to kill a Christian in order to ritually reenact the murder of Jesus. The blood libel asserted that Jews needed the blood of a Christian in order to produce matzah for Passover. All three of these charges are Christian counter-ritual accusations. That is, in each case, the Christians imagine a Judaism that works like 13th century Christianity. To people who took the embodiment of Christ in the Eucharist very seriously, it made perfect sense that Judaism would require a similar, uh, a similar ritual assumption that people would want to defile the wafer. The blood libel similarly made sense because the imagined requirements of visceral blood made sense within the 13th century visceral world of medieval Christianity. One must understand the symbolic meaning of the burning of the Talmud in light of these cultural realities. The burning of the Talmud, I argue, is the inverse of these charges. The Jewish text, at that time existing only in handwritten form, I'm going to come back to this, is personified and then ritually murdered as a symbol of Judaism and contemporary Jews. This makes a lot of sense in, in the way people thought religiously at the time. This symbolic understanding is enhanced by the realization that unlike the heavily iconic medieval Christianity, medieval Christianity has a lot of icons, medieval Ashkenazic Judaism is rigidly icon-free. According to the Ten Commandments, Judaism is supposed to be against icons, but if you're a true historian, you know that throughout Jewish history, the level of an iconism changes over time. If you come from a particular Hasidic mystical background, there would have been lions on your, on your ark. Even the, the tabernacle in the Bible is described as having animal images on it. Medieval Ashkenaz, 13th century Northern Europe, is a community that took an iconism seriously. They had no visual symbols of any kind. The Talmud, on the, they didn't even have like Star of David, right? The Talmud, on the other hand, was a work that this community invested in quite heavily. 
more so actually than any other contemporaneous Jewish culture in the medieval period. The burning of the Talmud was an effective destruction of a Jewish symbol. It was effectively a passion story in reverse. In my biography of the Talmud, I developed the idea that there are three different registers that exist when we speak of the Talmud. I label these three registers the essential, the enhanced, and the emblematic registers. And I'll explain these registers a bit more clearly as we go along now. I'll start with the essential. The Talmud is a book. It's a work of literature produced in a specific time and place and to some extent confined to the meaning that emerges from its words. Certainly my fundamentalist uh, within me still believes these things. For those of you who don't know, the Talmud is the culmination of a movement known as Rabbinic Judaism, which over a 700 year period, beginning with the destruction of the temple in the year 70 CE, reimagined what Judaism could be for a diasporic existence, or an existence without the temple in Jerusalem. While before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the cult of Judaism consisted almost entirely of temple-based sacrificial rites, after the rabbinic period, Judaism became a text-focused, comprehensive religious ideology with a demanding and rigorous set of mandated behaviors that had nothing to do with sacrificial rites, or almost nothing to do with sacrificial rites. The Talmud reads like a rabbinic conversation that lasts several hundred years, with later rabbis interpreting and debating the ideas of their predecessors. Their debates include many layers of nuanced interpretation and many original theological or legal ideas, along with a large collection of stories about the rabbis themselves. The Talmud is famous for the ways in which the rabbis quite brazenly usurp the authority of God, in the famous oven of Achnai story, where they say, God, we don't even care what you think. We've decided by majority what the rule should be. They tolerate the possibility of true religious and legal pluralism when they say there can be multiple religious truths that, though contradictory, can still be the truth of the faith. And they resist the impulse to resolve open debate. So most Talmudic passages do not end with resolution. They end in the middle of a debate. When we speak of the Talmud's meaning, we often um, reference the meaning of the Talmud as a book, and that is what I refer to as the essential meaning of the Talmud. When I fought the good fight for the Talmud as truth in, the in my 20s, I was advocating for an understanding of the essential Talmud, while my opponents were emphasizing the enhanced Talmud. In the enhanced Talmud, the Talmud is the center of elite ideological conversations. The Talmud has generated lots of literature since its conclusion, since the Talmud was closed in the middle of the 8th century CE. People have been studying it and they have been writing different types of literature on it. So there's responsa, which are uh, rabbinic answers to questions that people produce about the religion. There are codes, so there are, th those are legal codes that distill the content of the Talmud into a more usable, usable form. And then there are commentaries which track the Talmud's own language and try to explain line for line what the Talmud means. And those different literatures of reception, which were produced from the 8th century, and they continue to be produced in the present, but they've been produced continuously from the 8th century to the present, that is really the enhanced discourse of the Talmud, and that's where the Talmud's enhanced meaning is located. But for the sake of this book, I was also, so the, the gap between the essential and the enhanced, um, while the terminology for it is my own, Recognition of the existence of these two registers is not entirely new with me. Chaim Potok, the novelist, wrote a novel called The Promise, where the central dramatic tension of the book is between these two different ways of, of approaching the Talmud. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend uh, Potok's The Promise. Now, the, emblic, the emblematic register, since at least the 13th century and the example of the Disputation of Paris, the Talmud has functioned as a symbol of Judaism, Jewishness, and the Jews. And the emblematic register is interrelated with the Talmud's essential and enhanced registers. It was, after all, the anti-Christian content that Nicholas Donnan was writing about in the first place. But the internal content, the specific narrow debates, is the Talmud anti-Christian in this or that passage, are dwarfed by the symbolism of the Talmud's trial, its conviction, and its execution. And so now I'm, I want to move from this original iconization of the Talmud in the 13th century 
all the way down to the present. I'm going to basically do a history of the Talmud as a book, leading us up to the present to make some comments about present day study of Talmud. Uh, Richard pointed out my, my final chapter of my book. This is kind of like the afterword to that final chapter. So what I'm saying here is not in that chapter, but it kind of builds on some of the, the stuff in that chapter. So in my ensuing remarks, I want to move from the 13th century to the present and make an additional argument in the symbolic register, an argument about the iconization of the Talmud, how the Talmud became an icon. The story I'm about to tell is the story of how the Talmud acquired a fixed and rigid body and how that body is becoming a religious icon and inspiring new modes of religious interaction with the text. I'll start the story back in the first century at the dawn of the rabbinic movement. The rabbis produced all of their literature orally. This fact is undisputed, but especially for us moderns, quite shocking. Rabbinic literature includes many different works, the Talmud being the, mo the largest and the most impressive. The Talmud, just to give you a sense of scale, dwarfs the Bible in size. It is much larger than the Bible. The rabbis operated within a relatively literate culture, and the culture was regularly producing the Hebrew Bible as a written document on parchment scrolls. Despite the availability of writing as a technology, the rabbis did not avail themselves of the scroll or book. They pridefully described their own literature as oral Torah and insisted that it remain untranscribed. The Talmud would circulate and be studied orally until the ninth century when some began to write it down. And we know that some began to write it down because we have records of one school bad-mouthing another school, you know, because at Davis they study, they have to write it down. We at UCSB don't need to, right? Um, so that's how we know that when the Talmud started to be write, written down. Some of the early transcriptions of the Talmud were produced on parchment scrolls similar to the ones on which Jews from antiquity until today write their Torah. But by the 9th century, the more popular and better technology was the Codex, a bound paper book that was designed for scribes to handwrite something. From the 9th to the 15th centuries, the Talmud was copied in part or whole by professional scribes and also non-professional learners who would copy it for their own purposes all over the world. As with any ancient text that survives the vicissitudes of transcription, it's kind of like a long game of telephone. The Talmud has some degree of variance between and among its different manuscripts. And medieval commentators are hyper aware of this. And they can sometimes make reference to the different version they have in front of them to explain a logical problem they have in the text. With the dawn of print in the 15th century, the Talmud began to be printed. The earliest printings of, individual tra of popular individual tractates took place in Iberia, in Spain, Portugal, also in Fez, Morocco. The expulsion of the Jews of Iberia shifted the locus of printing from Spain and Iberia to Italy, where the well-known Sansino family of printers published some important first editions of tractates, of individual tractates, in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. But between 1520 and 1523, we're celebrating the 500th anniversary right now, uh, the Christian printer Daniel Bomberg, originally from Antwerp, produced a deluxe and complete edition of the Babylonian Talmud. This edition established the pagination of the Talmud forever after. References to the Talmud will always include citations to a page number and a folio side, 23A, 23B. If you trace the development of Talmud printing from the 1520s to the 1820s, and I had some fun doing this in rare book rooms around the world, um, you discover that the Talmud was printed fairly often, so that's not so surprising, and that each new edition attempts to add features that improve upon prior editions. So it's like a nice history of marketing. These features are aesthetic. We have better paper, better fonts, cleaner lines. They are sometimes intellectual. Our edition produces a new commentary that you didn't have before, or they're practical. We have a new layout or a new apparatus for cross-reference that you didn't have before. But by the time you get to the Amsterdam edition of the Proops Press in the late 18th century, the 1780s, you find most of the features of Talmud editions that we see today. But at the end of the 19th century, one edition published in the 1880s came to not just dominate, but to monopolize the market. The Vilna Shas of the 1880s was produced by, uh, the company was called the Widow and Brothers Ram Press. There had been two earlier versions of the Ram Press, an 1820s version, which was actually a kind of a plagiarism of a rival press, and an 1850s version um, that reproduced the 1820s version without really updating it. But the 1880s one 
provided the reader with a new, there was a new feature. This new tier of commentary was added to the page. Every page now has a third tier of commentaries that had either never before been published or were very hard to come by. Some of them were actually um, entirely hidden in the Vatican Library. Though the stereotype technology that the Rams employed in producing the Talmud could have enabled them to compete on price, the Ram chose, Rams chose to create a luxury Talmud, kind of like think about what Apple does sometimes, producing a more impressive work, but also one that costs as much as five times what rival presses were charging. The strategy was effective. Publication of the Ram Shas put several competing Talmud printers out of business, and the stereotyping technologies allowed the Rams to print the work almost on demand. Where the 1820s and 1850s editions of Rams had sold out, now the Rams could print new copies when their stock was low. This ensured that the Ramshas was always available. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the Rams still had competitors, but this edition was recognized as the deluxe one and the one people aspired to. When you, if you want to buy a complete set, the one you want is the Ram. World War I augmented this monopoly. The occupation of Vilnius, Vilna, led to rumors that the Ram press had been destroyed which encouraged American and British printers to employ brand new photo offset technology to reproduce the ROM edition in both London and New York without paying for it. Though the ROM press would emerge after World War I and reassert its copyright after the war, some of the damage was already done. What was bad for ROM's business was good for the rise of the ROM edition as the default edition of Talmud in the 20th century. When after World War II, the United States Army decided to repurpose a Nazi printing house and print an edition of the Talmud on German paper, they employed photo offset technology and reproduced the Ram edition. And this is how by the end of World War II, the Ram edition had become the Talmud's modern body, a work that had once been oral and had survived a half millennium period of handwritten transcription and variants that had been printed in over 100 editions was now associated with a single print edition. The full ramifications of Ram's monopoly would materialize in the context of two translation projects in the second half of the 20th century. Beginning in the late 1960s, uh, sorry, beginning in the late 1960s, the prominent Israeli public intellectual Adin Steinzaltz began to produce an edition of the Talmud that vocalized the text. Hebrew is a non-vocalic text, so the original printed editions don't have vowels. So he added vowels and offered a paraphrastic translation from the ancient Hebrew Aramaic to modern Hebrew. He also incorporated some scientific data. Now, Steinzeltz edition maintained the general look of a Talmud page, central text surrounded by commentary, but it did not adhere to the pagination established by the 16th century Bomberg edition. It, <clears throat> pardon me, it replaced the Rashi typeface commonly used for Talmud commentaries with some other modern typefaces. And it moved the Tosafists out of their usual position. They're here instead of there. The Steindel's edition was very popular with Israeli non-religious learners. Israel's a very bifurcated society. It's half religious, half non-religious. The non-religious embraced it. And in the United States, it was popular with those non-Orthodox Jews who at the time studied it in the Talmud, mostly in rabbinical schools. But it was decidedly unpopular with Orthodox Jews in both the United States and Israel, and it developed a particularly harsh response from the ultra-Orthodox. For the ultra-Orthodox, Steinzeltz edition was seen as an assault on a tradition embodied by the Vilna Shas. Whether the objection was phrased as a problem with Steinzeltz's placement of his own translation in place of the Tosafists or the newfangled pagination, in retrospect, this was a debate about the Talmud as a symbol, and some of the issue had to do with the problem of transforming the Talmud's visual image. For traditional Jews, the Talmud had come to have one physical form, the Vilna Shas, and any attempt to alter that form, however much it would be an improvement, was an offense to tradition. In the early 1990s, the Art Scroll Press, an ultra-Orthodox press that had had already 20 years of success marrying aesthetics to a traditional Orthodox way of thinking about things, began to publish its own translation of the Talmud. Keyed into the ultra-Orthodox world and familiar with the Steinzaltz fiasco, Art Scroll, the Art Scroll folks resolved the tension over the symbolics in a curious way. Art Scroll produced its own vocalization and English translation of the Talmud, coupled with selected nuggets translated from the millennium of Talmud commentaries, right? So uh, just to, if I have a, I think this has a pointer. Yeah, so this is the art scroll. So you see the Vilna is on the right, reproduced. 
And then on the left, this is where they put their vocalization and their English translation and their notes. Now, Art Scroll was not the first to come up with the idea of a facing page translation. The Sansino Talmud, a British translation of the Talmud into English, had produced a facing page edition in the early 1970s. The problem is that the Talmud is so complex and its language is so dense that it's a major challenge to fit the English on the facing page side. The Sansino edition solved this problem by spilling over into an additional section in the back. So you kind of have to hold your finger in place and go to the back and look at the additional section. It's a very impractical approach. Artsville came up with their own solution. Instead of trying to fit the translation into a single page, they reproduce the Vilna page as many times as it is necessary for the translation side. So each Vilna page gets reproduced between three and six times. I've even seen some places in the Talmud where the material is so hard that the page gets reproduced eight times on the right side or the left side so that there's enough space for the translation. This environmentally disastrous solution, which unnecessarily reprints the same page multiple times, turns out to be genius. The Art Scroll edition has created a market for translated Talmud that has never been seen before. Some of its volumes had sold upwards of a million copies. The success of Art Scroll has inspired imitation. New Steinsalz translations have been published in both Hebrew and English that now incorporate the Vilna image on one side. An academic commentary series produced by the Society for the Interpretation of the Talmud incorporates the policy of reprinting the Vilna page side. Even the Barilan Responsa database, the first and still the best digital text database of Jewish texts, offers all of its books in digital text format with one exception. When you work on the Talmud, you have the option of pulling up the page image of the Vilna. Now, I open today's remarks with a, with a reference to the recent celebrations and completion of a Dafyomi cycle. And Dafyomi is a program through which participants study one double-sided page of Talmud per day, every day. It takes seven and a half years to finish the Talmud. And I understand some of you have started this commitment now, so good luck. Um, Dafyomi was once an obscure phenomenon that interested a small cadre of elite scholars. People who did it were former or current yeshiva students with tremendous reading fluency in the text. But today, Dafyomi has been universalized as a lay learning project. In the United States, nearly every metropolitan Orthodox synagogue that offers daily prayer services also offers Dafyomi classes. There are Dafyomi classes on the Long Island Railroad and on the internet. There are tons of podcasts. There has been tremendous symbiosis in the relationship between Dafyomi and the Art Scroll uh, Talmud. Now, for those of you who have not studied the Talmud, let me know that the Talmud is hard. And the pace of studying two sides of Talmud a day is difficult, if not impossible, for many, if not most, I would say 90-something percent of participants in Dafyomi. So when we evaluate Dafyomi as a phenomenon, we need to be a little suspicious of it purely as an intellectual activity. So I'm not saying it's not also an intellectual activity, but there's something else going on religiously in this revival of Dafyomi. Like many religious communal activities, Dafyomi has significant social value. It creates a daily bonding exercise for its participants who are fellow travelers on the seven and a half year journey. In some places, Dafyomi classes are a cross between educational exercises and ritual activities. I know of some Dafyomi lectures with the reputation of finishing the two sides in 30 minutes or less. These lectures amount to something like the ritual recitation of the Talmud's text. And Jews have seen this film before. The Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, were first read to the public in the Second Temple period as an educational program. It's how Ezra taught the people of Judea what Judaism was about. Even in the rabbinic period, there was simultaneous translation to make the Torah's content digestible to the synagogue crowd in Aramaic or in Greek. Today, though, Torah reading is 99% ritual and 1% educational, if that. In many places in the world, the congregation does not understand the language of the Torah. And in those places in which they do, they often do not attend to the meaning of a text that's recited musically and quite rapidly. Even the readers don't really pay attention to what they're reading. The Talmud in modernity, I argue, is currently undergoing a process of ritualization through Dafyomi. Further evidence of this comes in the form of weekly study sheets for children called Dafyomi for Kids that are being distributed in Israel alongside the ubiquitous examples of such sheets that relate to the weekly Torah portion. So if you go into any synagogue in Israel, you'll see tons of these sheets of things about the weekly Torah portion. You will now see Dafyomi distillations and this one, Dafyomi for Kids. <laughs> 
Like the Torah reading, Dafyomi has become a communal calendar. Just as the Jewish community collectively reenacts the Bible and its narrative through the Torah reading, it enacts the Talmud through Dafyomi. The children's Dafyomi sheets make it possible for a child to keep up with a parent's Dafyomi studies by knowing that this week, for example, they covered issues of divorce law, or whatever it is they're covering. Um, let me now, they're, up to, they're in the Sabbath laws now. Let me now return to discuss the Talmud's fixed physical form, the Vilna edition. It's fair to point out, that, as I did earlier, that the Ram edition was quite popular already in the 19th century, for good reasons. The quality of the paper, the new commentary, um, the luxury reputation. It's also important to remember the photo offset story and World War I and that whole thing. But even with these factors, factors, I think there's other things that contribute to the rise of the Vilna image today and this obsession with the Vilna image. One of the most important distinctions that religion scholars make is the distinction between traditional and traditionalist practices. The emancipation of the Jews in modernity created individual autonomy that had not previously existed. A 15th century Jew had no choice but to live within a religious community and abide by its strictures and practices. Jews in modernity, even those in the most fundamentalist environments, have a choice. And this important fact leads to traditionalism, which is a deliberate attempt to assert tradition in the face of modernity. Dafyomi is a traditionalist ritual that affords the autonomous modern Jew the opportunity to engage a traditionally significant text. It is a decidedly modern phenomenon because even at the height of the Talmud's import in 19th century Eastern Europe, only a very tiny percentage of the male population would have been able to do it. When Dafyomi was first initiated in the early 20th century, only the yeshiva educated could do it. Today's universal education practices and the printing of translations like art scrolls have enabled the modern production of a traditionalist ritual. The distinction between traditional and traditionalist has something to say about religious performance. Irving Goffman developed the idea of personal identity in general as being related to performance. Someone living a traditional Jewish life in 15th century would also have been, in Goffman's sense, engaging in religious performance. So don't be misled. But we can distinguish between traditional and traditionalist practices by noticing that when you are doing a traditional practice, you are traditionalist practice, you are more out of step with the performances of the larger culture, and thus you are more visible. Traditionalism masks change in the face of changing realities. Consider the ultra-Orthodox decision for women to cover their hair or for men to wear black frocks and hats, including some fur-lined hats. Now, these practices were not that out of step in cold Eastern Europe. But when someone's wearing a strimal on an 80 degree day in Israel, the religious performance as a performance is that much more visible. One thing that develops under these conditions is that the integrity of the performance becomes that much more important for the practitioner who understands the behavior as a performance. It's like a role that you're playing. So to do dafyomi, one has to be able to see oneself as a traditional learner. And a traditional learner learns from a Vilna Shas. You also see, notice if you ever open an art scroll, the front cover is doing something interesting with the traditional um, frontispiece of the Vilna edition. Now, together with religious traditionalism, there's also a strong role for nostalgia to play in the current fetishization of the image of the Talmud. In this post-Holocaust Jewish world, there is considerable nostalgia for the vanished world of Eastern Europe. Recall uh, Roman Vizniak's lost world images, which it turned out were completely distorted. Um, much of this nost nostalgia overwhelms the historical realities of Eastern Europe before World War II and projects an imagined universal shtetl life. Everyone was in Fiddler on the Roof, in which the Talmud, visualized as the Vilna edition, played an unchallenged role, which is not true. The Vilna provenance of the Ram edition makes it easier to think of the Talmud as a time machine, allowing the learner to use its portal to travel to the yeshivas of Slobodka or Volozhin. Finally, let me return to the Art Scroll Talmud and notice the brilliance of its facing page apparatus. So maybe I should go back to it for this. The Talmud's, Art Scroll Talmud's English translation is very easy to understand. In fact, I would argue that it's too easy. The Talmud is hard even for specialists, which is why it always made very little sense as a lay study text. Art Scroll has fixed this problem by making it easy. Of course, in order to do this, it has incorporated commentary into the translation and eliminated some of the things that make the essential Talmud so interesting and help explain where the enhanced Talmud comes from. A thousand years of people were debating because these things are tough. 
but Art School makes them easy by incorporating Rashi's commentary. The problem with simplicity, if you make it simple, is that it undermines gravitas. If the Talmud is easily understood, how is the learner to comprehend its depth and why the special skill of studying this text has granted certain figures, rabbis, communal authority? The facing Vilna page is an effective way of perpetually reminding the reader that the Talmud is actually hard, but is being made easy for them. Let this thing sink in first, this image sink in. And if you're in the back, you may not see this very well. So I will be describing this. Too. There have been, there have recently been some outstanding, work, outstanding works of art that employ the Vilna page image of the Talmud. In fact, one of those works of art is the basis for my cover art. And I talk about it in the book. It's a feminist critique of the Talmud called um, If They Only Asked Us, right? It's about what the Talmud would look like if it was written by women, All right? So, this, but this, is, um, this is a different artwork that I'm talking about here. This is Nechama Golan's work, You Shall Walk in Good Ways. And it's a feminist critique of tradition that employs the Vilna image of the Talmud as the default image of tradition. By now, this move should not come as a surprise to this audience. What I've attempted to show is that for hundreds of years, the Talmud has functioned as a Jewish symbol, and some of its meaning has taken place within a symbolic register. What's happened uniquely in modernity is the Talmud finally has acquired a formal body. It is now really an icon, a symbolic representation that allows the Talmud to work as an icon and has prompted new religious practices and modes of engagement. The iconic status is only beginning to be tapped into in the world of contemporary art. So Golan's shoe, and this is my interpretation of this work of art, Golan's shoe is the Talmud as Cinderella's slipper. The passage that appears on the shoe is one in which a woman is the grammatical subject, ha'isha, but the legal object. It's about how marriage works. The woman is the object of the man's acquisition of her at the wedding. The framed word ha'isha, meaning the woman, celebrates this grammatical subject, but the content of the sentence, how a woman is acquired in marriage, denigrates her. The Talmud on the shoe is rendered aesthetic and sexualized. The shoe forces the viewer to think about female fashion and the male gaze, about female sexual agency as a passive aggressive come hither invitation to male sexual desire. By marrying the Talmud produced and consumed historically by men with the female shoe, Golan introduces gender expectations and the relationship between gender and tradition into the conversation. This is yet another way in which the Talmud's realization of an iconic form has created new religious opportunities in modernity. While the evidence of a symbolic register is not new, I hope that I have demonstrated that the Talmud's highly visual symbolics are a recent and rapidly changing contemporary phenomenon. In my book, I point out that in the last few decades, the Talmud has developed an increasingly diverse audience of Christian readers, philosophical readers, gay identity seeker readers. In Chicago, near where I live, there is a, a queer yeshiva called Svara that dedicates itself to the queering of the Talmud. Um, there are legal readers. There are literary theorists who invoke the Talmud. One of the writers of Seinfeld, Larry Charles, suggested that that successful television program was itself a dark Talmud. Because of this, I'm not entirely, I was not entirely surprised a few weeks ago when I was bombarded on social media by a diverse group of posters pledging a commitment to the new cycle of Dafyomi to make their own way in the Sea of Talmud. And I understand there are some people here, including Rabbi Cohen. Is Rabbi Cohen here? Oh, maybe Rabbi Cohen's not here. But I understand there, there was some recent energy um, around this also locally in Santa Barbara, people committing themselves to study Dafyomi. Um, and I'm not surprised by that because there's been an expanding audience for the Talmud. The Talmud is famously a work of dialogue between many rabbinic male voices. It will be most interesting to the Talmud's future biography to see what happens when the voices in this conversation become non-rabbinic and diverse. Thank you. <laughs>